Good evening, everyone. Is everyone can see? All right, let's start. It's seven o'clock sharp now. Uh, thank you very much for uh, attending, and hopefully, it will be a uh, an interactive session. Uh, and what I'm going to do, I will talk about male infertility in general, uh, and then if there is any questions, uh, we will uh, answer them in between. Uh, otherwise, we will uh, keep talking about male infertility. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Hussain Zini. Uh, I, I am a reproductive endocrinologist and fertility specialist, um, which means that I'm subspecialized in infertility and uh, hold the CRI. Uh, I work at the uh, Royal Women's Hospital as a medical director uh, in the Reproductive Services Unit and also I work as a medical director in uh, Melbourne IVF. I also work at the satellite clinics of um, uh, Wyndham Hospital and also North Park Hospital. Uh, I work in this field for 20 years now and beside um, having expertise in all aspects of male and female infertility. I have a special interest in dealing with uh, women with low ovarian reserve, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and recurrent implantation failure. And also I have a special expertise with microsurgery that allow me to be able to do uh, microscopic testicular sperm extraction, tubal reversal, and vasectomy reversal as well. I am a full-time reproductive endocrinologist and fertility specialist, which means I'm uh, dedicating 100% of my time uh, to infertility treatment. I frequently see patients who come to see me for a second opinion, which they usually take longer time. That's why uh, we need dedication. After this introduction, uh, we will hit into the, our subject today. So with uh, male infertility, we would like to have a little bit of uh, physiology so we can understand uh, when things goes wrong and also we are going to offer options of what to do uh, when things goes wrong so the, um, the 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 fertility actually is determined once the uh, sperm has fertilized the egg so and then with the first few divisions um, we as males we have 46 chromosomes and XY and if there is any disturbance here uh, when we have an extra X chromosomes for example then we develop a condition called Klinefelter syndrome we'll talk about that later on but that's the beginning so the Y chromosome is very important it carries all the important genes which are responsible for the sperm formation so the first disruption or problems that can happen is with chromosomal abnormalities here and the most common scenario that lead to infertility is Klinefelter syndrome now after puberty with the development of the brain and the testis what will happen is that you need to have a, a interaction between the axis which is we call hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis so the hypothalamus produce certain hormones that stimulate the pituitary gland to produce two important hormones called FSH and LH. It's not exactly like in women. But one, what happened? In men, that FSH goes to the uh, special cells in the, uh, in the testis uh, in an area called seminiferous tubules. This is where the sperm is being formed. So you need that follicle stimulating hormone. Next to them, there are some cells called leydig cells, and they are the cells that produce the testosterone. Okay, so you have to have the interaction between the two for the sperm formation uh, to be formed. Okay, and then um, the, the, after the sperm becomes mature, the sperm goes through forms in the wall of the seminiferous tubules. There's about six steps up until we reach to the maturity stage. And then uh, once they are released in the lumen of the tubule, they go into another area called epididymis. So it's like another tube attached to, or a middle tube attached to the testis itself. And the sperm goes there and acquire uh, uh, certain functions and stored there up until ejaculation happens. So you need to have all these axes there, okay? The chromosomes normal, you need to have the hormones working, you need to have the sperm formation working and you need to have the passage of the sperm to the outside 
clear without obstruction and you need to have the function of the ability to ejaculate okay then uh, the sperm after ejaculation uh, is uh, at the time of ovulation in in uh, during in the vaginal secretions while it's going up to meet the the egg it will acquire also certain characteristics something that we call capacitation or the ability of the sperm to fertilize the egg and there is also there is many steps until up until the sperm is able to fertilize the egg what what's the function of the sperm the function of the sperm is its ability to deposit the uh, half of the number of the chromosomes which is present in the sperm that have all the characteristics of that male okay it combined with the other half in the egg to form the embryo right the contribution of the embryo from both sperm and the egg is not equal okay the sperm is a very very tiny cell and just on the the whole cell of the sperm is just contains the uh, the package of the chromosomes all right so that's what goes inside there is also some other uh, small organelles that are uh, uh, contributed from the sperm uh, like something called centrioles it's like the hooks that that can be attached to the chromosomes that help during the cell division so that's very important uh, structure also there are some other structures that we call non-coding microRNA that has something to do with something else called epigenetics we may talk about this if anyone is interested um, so the egg has the all the machineries in the cytoplasm that make it able to deal with the uh, after fertilization division up until we form an embryo and a human being so uh, the egg here is so important and the egg also has the ability to fix some of the problems that the sperm can have like when there is a high degree of dna fragmentation and so forth so that's that's the process okay so now what can go wrong here if we go back chromosomal abnormalities can lead to infertility even no sperm in the ejaculate at all okay so there is um, after that we divide the problems that can happen into three um, uh, three stages or three phases one that we call pretesticular that's usually at the level of the hypothalamus and the pituitary so it's up in the brain there okay and what are the problems that can happen someone can be born with deficiency in that fsh and lh okay and this is a, a an important uh, syndrome okay people can have a, a a small tumor in the pituitary gland okay that can produce uh, the the prolactin or the milk hormone and that can lead to uh, infertility and even erectile dysfunction and uh, the most common scenario is uh, is androgen or, or testosterone abuse when people are using testosterone injection uh, for bodybuilding or so forth so that shuts off the uh, hypothalamic pituitary uh, uh, testicular axis okay and that can even lead to azospermia we will talk about those definitions later on so that's one part the other part is when there is a direct problem that happened to the testis itself like someone has had say testicular cancer uh, or exposed to a lot of chemotherapy that can destroy the sperm formation or radiotherapy the same or if there is any immunological problems where antibodies are formed and that can destroy the tissues of the seminiferous tubules uh, or trauma like torsion testicular torsion that can happen when you are playing football or doing something uh, or infection the most common scenario is mumps for example uh, especially if it happens after puberty that can also can uh, uh, destroy the seminiferous tubules um, and the other things lifestyle but you have to be exposed to heavy toxin um, or things like heavy radiation that can affect the sperm uh, uh, formation a uh, common scenario is undescended testis so the testis is expected to come down to the scrotum after delivery but the, the, there will be a small percentage of kids that will have what we call undescended testis that's a condition where the testis has not descended uh, in, in, in the scrotum and here uh, that child need to be operated on in the first two years of life otherwise the testis will stay inside the abdomen and for the testis to function well it has to be outside in a lower temperature than uh, intra-abdominal temperature 
So uh, these kids usually, if if there is no uh, if if there is no procedure that has been done to uh, bring the testes down, they have a problem with uh, maybe property puberty and 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 sperm formation, and and it can lead to infertility. Um, also, we mentioned the Y chromosome. So there are sometimes conditions where the uh, there are three important groups of genes there. We call them uh, A and B and C. If there is any deletion or micro deletion or they are missing, that can affect the sperm formation, can even lead to no sperm uh, at all in the ejaculate. So that's a group that we call when there is a testicular problem. And then another group which we call post-testicular. And these are usually the ones who will have blockage, okay? So the testis is forming the sperm okay, but there is a blockage which may be at the level of the testis itself or due to infection or a congenital problem where the person is born with. And the, the most common scenario when there is a, con, a, a genetic problem is the cystic fibrosis. Patients who are, or males who are a carrier of the mutation of the cystic fibrosis will be born without the, uh, the, the, the middle uh, uh, tube that, that uh, connects the uh, sperm or transfer the sperm from the testis to the outside which we call uh, congenital bilateral absence uh, of, of, of the vast difference, okay? Um, also, uh, the, the obstruction can be a little bit further, uh, and uh, there are certain tubes or tubule, tubes that, that connect the sperm from the testis to the outside. Uh, there is uh, one tube which uh, is called uh, ejaculatory duct, and if there is any obstruction there, that also can prevent uh, the sperm from reaching to the outside. The most common obstruction that we see is the what we call the iatrogenic one, the one which is done as a result of surgery, which is vasectomy. Okay, um, so it, it, the, there is other issues that can also interfere with the fertility, or which e, which is in the ability to ejaculate. Okay, that's called an ejaculation, and we see that on patients who have neurological disorders or spinal cord injury uh, or diabetes. So, and, and also a varicocele may impair the, uh, uh, the sperm quality. Also, the other uh, category is when uh, people have a retrograde ejaculation. So the, the sperm is expected, or the semen is expected to be ejaculated through uh, to, the, to the urethra, to, fro from the uh, prostate uh, to the urethra, to the outside. And what happens is that uh, the, the semen can go back and be ejaculated inside the bladder rather than to the outside. That also can be due to uh, neurological problems. Um, so if there is a problem for the sperm to be ejaculated to the outside, that also can lead to the infertility, okay? So this is basically all of the situations that can happen uh, uh, in, in, in uh, cases of male infertility. Now, um, you, for example, have been trying for, say, a year, okay, you are 35 years old, your partner is 32 years old, you are trying for a year, she have regular cycle, and, um, uh, and you know, no, no children yet, okay, no conception. So the first thing that we are going to do is to do a semen analysis. Obviously, we will take a full history from the female partner. And when it comes to the male partner, we start with the semen analysis. This is very important. And what are we looking at in the semen analysis? We look at the volume of the semen. This is very important. And we look at the count of the sperm. According to the WHO criteria, we should have a minimum of 15 millions. The average guy will produce 75 millions. And the normal will be ranging between 15 millions and 200 millions. Um, and then we look at the motility, which is the percentage of the sperm that moves in the right direction and right speed. We need at least their 32% uh, uh, motile. And then the last parameter is the shape of the sperm or the morphology. So it is normal to have most of the sperm having abnormal shape, but we need at least 4% of the sperm have normal shape because the shape of the sperm is very important and that's what determines the ability of the sperm to fertilize the egg. Um, if we do the sperm test and there is some abnormalities like, say the count come back lower than expected, say 10 millions, 
the next step to do is to repeat the semen analysis again because there is a huge variability that can happen um, every time uh, we will do a semen analysis. So we just want to make sure that it is not a, a it is a constant problem and not variable, okay, depending on other circumstances. Now, what if the, the semen analysis come back as abnormal as well? It depends on the abnormalities which, uh, which are there. Say if we uh, have, we, when we look at the count, we, 10 millions will be considered to be like a mild abnormality, okay? And, um, but the chance of conception with it will be much lower than if you have the lower uh, uh, 15 millions. And by the way, the count of, or the semen analysis in general is a poor predictor of the fertility. It doesn't mean that you have a normal semen analysis, that you are fertile, and the opposite. You may have a 10 millions, but you have a good quality sperm, which function very well, and you will still father lots of children without even knowing that you have 10 millions. It is not a good predictor. But why we are doing it? We are doing it because there are cases where there will be severe uh, or very, very low count or severe oligospermia. That's when the sperm count is lower than 5 million. So that's clear here that we have a male fertility problem. And the other, uh, on the other side also, there is other also category of patients that will have no sperm in the ejaculate. These are the most severe forms. And we will talk about that later on because they are really the most important category here, right? Um, so what happened if uh, the, the semen analysis come back as less than 5 million? That's, that's the severe form of male infertility. Or if it come back as azospermia, which means no sperm in the ejaculate. What should we do here? Here we have to, to have a complete history from the male since he was born till now, okay? So we ask if there is any history of undescended testes. Has he done the operation or not? Any trauma happened to him? How did he go through uh, puberty? Okay, has he been using any uh, and, uh, um, and, uh, androgen or testosterone? Has he got infection? All the stuff that we talked about that can affect the, 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 the testes. And then we have to do a complete physical examination with a concentration on local examination. So here we concentrate on the size of the testis. That's very, very important and it can differentiate certain conditions for us. We feel for that tube that connects from the testis to the vas that we call epididymis, right? And um, we feel also for the, for the vas itself to see if it's there or not. Uh, also, we rule out other conditions like varicocele or if there is any mass or tumor. Um, also, from the physical appearance of the patient, we can sometimes uh, spot diagnose certain conditions like Klinefelter syndrome, for example, okay? So we look at the secondary sexual characteristics of the patients and how he look, the fat distribution, all these things can tell us that there is a problem there which is linked to the fertility. Right, so we have done the physical examination. Now we need to order some investigations. I am now talking about patients who are having less than 5 million sperm. So we need from them to do their karyotype, which is the chromosomal testing. It's a blood test that you will do, okay? And they will tell us about the, your chromosomal makeup. Uh, uh, and, and that's mainly to exclude certain chromosomal abnormalities and mainly uh, Klinefelter syndrome, where there is an extra X chromosome there. Normally, um, any male will have 46 chromosomes, including the X and Y chromosome. When you have an extra X chromosome, that makes you infertile, okay? Um, so that's the first thing to do. And then we check for the what we call YQ microdeletion. So specifically, we look at those genes to see if they are present or not. And as I mentioned before, there is A and B and C. Okay, we will talk about them later on. Uh, and also, uh, we, we, we do, if, if for example, the hormones are normal, because we, uh, this is what we are going to check as well. We will check the hormones. What hormones we are going to check? We check the uh, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, and we look for the testosterone, okay, the free testosterone and the, um, uh, the bound testosterone in the blood. And it's very important to do the test early in the morning at 8 o'clock because there is variation, diurnal variation with the testosterone. So you have to do it early in the morning at 8 o'clock. 
If the patient have erectile dysfunction, then I will add the prolactin level as well. Now, if this patient, going back, if this patient have normal uh, hormonal profile, his FSH and testosterone is within the normal range, then he is more likely going to have an obstructive, what we call obstructive azospermia or blockage. And then I may ask here to do the cystic fibrosis uh, gene mutation, okay? And also an ultrasound if there is a low volume. The volume is so important and key factor here, right? Uh, so patients who have blockage, they will have a lower volume because not all of the semen will come out, okay? They will have a low volume. That's very, very characteristic. So I get worried when I have a normal volume, okay? And there is no sperm there. That make you think that it's more likely not obstructive azospermia. Here, and I have a few cases that were a bit unusual, uh, but they were having a normal volume, okay, and their hormones were 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 normal, and 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 they and and they were not having obstructive azospermia here. Um, so these are the main tests that we do: the hormones, the uh, and this is tested in the blood, and then the genetic testing. Okay, and we may ask for an ultrasound. I don't ask for ultrasound for every patient. That will be, say, if I examine a patient and there is a tumor there or a mass, then I will ask for an ultrasound on the testes here, right? If I'm suspecting that there is an obstruction there and there is a low volume, then I will do a transrectal ultrasound to look for that ejaculatory duct obstruction. Okay, so the treatment, the, the, in, that ultrasound here should be targeted, not for every patient. Um, I think there was a claim doing ultrasound for everyone because there is a small chance of, uh, it is a very, very small chance of, of associated uh, uh, cancer as well. Okay, so, but that chance is so, so small, doesn't worry that we do an ultrasound for every patient. So these are really all the investigations which is needed. Now, how do we uh, manage when we, first of all, we need to, when we are having a couple and, and there is an issue, we need really to find out, is it, is it a male factor problem or a female factor problem or it's a combined problem? Interestingly, like a third of the patients will have a female problem, third will have male, and another third will be combined, male and female. And if you look at the combined plus the third, male factor here comprises about 50% of the cases. The good news is, that whenever there is sperm in the ejaculate there, it's not a big deal, it's not a problem at all now. People can have children since 1992 when a, 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 that technique has been introduced that we call ICSI or intracytoplasmic sperm injection. We only need one sperm to inject it inside the egg, but the patient here needs to do IVF so we can extract the eggs from the female partner and then we inject only, we select and then inject uh, one single sperm. That's all that we need. I don't need all the millions which are there. Okay, so that's that's very reassuring for those couples who have a very low sperm count. But why we are doing uh, all these investigations and everything? So the, the the goal of the investigations or investigating the male factor. Uh, first of all, we need to find out if there is a reason there or a cause that can be reversed. Like, say, if someone is taking steroids, we can reverse that. We'll tell him to stop steroids and we give him some medications that can uh, bring the sperm back to normal. But usually those patients are not common, okay? So it's probably about 5% of the whole population of male infertility, okay? So that's the first reason why we are investigating. Second reason, sometimes we can have a genetic problem that can be passed to the children. Then here we might need to do a genetic testing for the embryo before uh, we do the embryo transfer. So we roll out any genetic uh, problem that can be there, okay? Common scenario is the cystic fibrosis. I just have a patient two weeks ago. Uh, he himself is having uh, cystic fibrosis and he just even had a tr uh, lung transplantation and his wife uh, ha was a carrier of cystic fibrosis as well. So here, when I haven't started treating them yet, but we are planning to do... Uh, so obviously he has obstructive azospermia. I've done the uh, testicular biopsy for him. We found sperm. I'm freezing it now. And we are going to uh, deal with the partner. We will do the IVF. And here we have to check the embryos for the cystic fibrosis before the embryo transfer. So that's the second reason. Third reason, sometimes those patients can be 
uh, having a deficiency in the testosterone level and they may need to have a long-term uh, treatment okay with the testosterone but we don't give testosterone for any patients who is planning to get pregnant that will shut all of hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis and he will not have sperm formation if we give him the testosterone there are other things that we give to maintain uh, his intratesticular testosterone to help with the sperm formation uh, what are the other things? The other things is that sometimes with the investigation, you don't want to miss any uh, any grave uh, problems like testicular cancer or something like that. So you need to do these investigations so you can rule out uh, these uh, problems. So it's very, very important. So the, the man is not just a semen analysis. It's very, very important to investigate and go through every step thoroughly. So now, what to do? We know now, if we have a low sperm count, first we will see if there is any reversible cause, anything that can be done to improve uh, the uh, sperm quality. But if we have a patient, if, if, if we, in most of the time, there is nothing to be, uh, that can be done here because most of the things that are looking at lifestyle factor and changes in certain habits and so forth, the sperm formation takes 72 days. So it is a time-consuming thing to say, all right, I'm going to improve my sperm from 10 uh, millions to, to 15 millions. That's probably can take you a year if it's going to happen. Okay. So here, uh, practically, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't wait that, especially if if you have a female partner who is a bit older and and you need to start the treatment. So uh, these changes in the lifestyle is not going to help that much. You need to be treated straight away, and the treatment is easy. Any fertility specialist can do that. Okay. So, it, with, because with any low sperm count, even a handful of sperm can, 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 can get the patient pregnant. The other important uh, category, which is the, the severe form, where there is no sperm in the ejaculate. When there is no sperm in the ejaculate, it will usually be due to one of two reasons. Either that we have uh, blockage, and that's what we call obstructive isospermia, and I've given some example like the cystic fibrosis and the vasectomy or we have a problem with the sperm formation and that that condition we call uh, non-obstructive azospermia we it is so important and mandatory to diagnose the case and to find out is it obstructive or non-obstructive because you don't want to fall on the issue of uh, you know choosing a procedure which is too much and not needed okay especially in the obstructive uh, side and also you may do a simple procedure which is needed and just waste your money and time if you have non-obstructive isospermia okay right I usually when I have a patient where there is no sperm in the ejaculate I am hoping that he will have obstructive isospermia because in 100% of the time I should be able to get sperm from him and the me method of choice or the procedure of choice is something called fine needle testicular biopsy. And here under local anesthetics, we introduce a needle that will go into the testicular tissue itself. And then we take some tubules there. They are usually not mini because it's just the needle that will take that. And within that tubule, uh, the, our scientist will take it and look at it under the microscope and will milk the sperm out of that tubule you in in nearly 100 percent of the time you will find sperm there okay that's in the obstructive type now uh, that's when you want to do things in a you know like you we don't have time for other treatments what are the other treatments for the obstructive time first we need to know if that obstruction is reversible surgically or not okay like say for example if you have assist in the ejaculatory duct or something like that you can you can remove it surgically if someone had a vasectomy then he will have the option here between doing a vasectomy reversal or ivf using that fine needle testicular biopsy but with the obstructive isospermia you only need the fine needle biopsy that can most of the time done under local anesthetics now the other category are the ones that need a little bit of work okay and the chance of finding sperm with them probably between 50 to 60 percent this is what we call non-obstructive azospermia 
And here we have a major problem in the sperm formation. The sperm either not formed at all or has been formed, but very, very small number that are produced, very tiny areas inside the testes that form the sperm, but they are not enough to show in the ejaculate. So what we do here after we do a full investigations, okay, the YQ microdeletion is important because it can tell us if this person does not need to do the procedure and we stop doing everything here and he needs to do a, a, a sperm donation. That's when we look at the YQ microdeletion. If the area which we call A or B is deleted or missed, that patient will it's probably, we would say about up to 4%, but you know, it's negligible. Yeah. So more likely we will tell him, do you want to do the operation for up to 4% or you want to do a sperm donation? So that test can tell you if you need to go ahead and do the procedure or not. These patients are usually having slightly high FSH, sometimes very high FSH. Their testosterone level will be in the e either low or in the normal low levels. We consider lower level 7.6 picomol of testosterone. If it's less than that, and, and you have a normal FSH or higher FSH, that's, uh, that's non-obstructive isospermy. Now, there are uh, some doctors who would say, I'm gonna do a fine needle biopsy for this patient, and then because the histology that I see under the microscope will tell me What's the chance of me finding sperm if I do the big operation that we will talk about? We discourage doctors from doing this because it, the chance of finding sperm, first of all, is very, very small. Secondly, it is a cost for the patient. So you're going to cost him twice, this operation and the other one. And it, it, the, the diagnosis is clear, okay? This is not going to add too much for, for you. And also, if you have done the, the biopsy many times, that can cause bleeding inside and, and, and you, can, you can have complication before you go for the big operation after that. So the diagnosis is very important and it's in most of the time clear what, what the patient has. So here we don't need to have intervention or a surgery which is not needed for the patient. Okay? Now, what happened here? If the patient have non-obstructive isosperm. You need to do a procedure called micro TC or microscopic testicular sperm extraction. That needs a high degree of expertise. I have done the highest number in Victoria and I have just done my audit recently uh, on um, the last hundred cases that I have done and our sperm retrieval rate, finding sperm there, is about 59 to 60 percent and of those patients that we found I had 55 percent pregnancy rate for these patients so these are international figures here so it's very very important for you to go to the doctor with the expertise in doing the micro TC otherwise you will do it in the way that they call conventional what's the difference the, my, what happened here is that you are having very tiny areas that form the sperm inside the testes. Under the, 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 the uh, operative microscope or higher magnification, you have to uh, cut into the testes as if you are opening a box, okay, and you look for these areas. That's a time-consuming procedure. It takes up to two hours. You have, and most of the time, to go to both sides. Um, and you have to locate those areas. And these are the ones that are most likely having sperm there. And it's a microscopic surgery, so everything is going to be done neatly. You will not lose too much tissue. Your testosterone more likely going to be preserved. It's, it's relatively... I, I, I have done lots of cases and I haven't had any single uh, 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 complication there, luckily so far. Okay? So um, it is a very sophisticated procedure and that's what will give you, it gives you the highest rate of finding sperm if you do it this way. But if you have done it before, and I have, I have seen a lot of patients who have done that and you do them uh, and, and they say they didn't find sperm and they are coming to you to ask to see if you can do the, the micro TC for them. Yes, we will do it, but 
already there is some damage that has been done and fibrosis and stuff like that. So it is good to start on a, on a testis that hasn't been operated on before. Then here you will give the patient the highest chance of finding sperm. Um, so one category of the patients who have the non-obstructive azospermia is the ones who have Klinefelter syndrome. And I have treated patients with Klinefelter syndrome and we are proud that we have pregnancies out of Klinefelter. I have uh, two patients with Klinefelter syndrome who have two children consecutively, not twins, okay, consecutively from Klinefelter syndrome. Um, so these patients were um, deemed sterile in the past, but with this procedure, Klinefelter syndrome patients can father children. So that's basically, um, you know, all of the journey with male infertility. So you will have patients who may have some abnormalities with the semen parameters, count, motility, or shape, right? You still can do a few things for them if it is, if, if it can be, and if it's not, then these patients will need to do ICSI or intracytoplasmic sperm injection, which is part of the IVF. Um, the other guys who have the non, uh, the obstructive, the uh, azospermia, they will be either obstructive and they will need to have a fine needle biopsy, and the non obstructive, they will need to have the micro TC. Uh, I'd like to talk also about a category of patients and common questions that we usually have, uh, which is uh, what if a patient who have, I have recently seen a couple where uh, the male partner has done a vasectomy and it was just um, two years ago and sadly uh, uh, the, the, their last child um, have passed away. So they come back and they ask me about what is the best approach here. So um, for them, uh, usually the um, vasectomy reversal, which I do, I have told him that this can be an option. Um, especially what determine which way to go, especially if the duration from doing the vasectomy till you are seeing the doctor is shorter than 90 years, uh, nine years. So shorter than nine years. Here you will get the best chance after the vasectomy reversal or the vasovasectomy. The longer the duration, what happens is that you will have back pressure on the other areas uh, before the obstruction and you will have what we call blow-ups or some obstructions at other levels. The vasectomy reversal is not a big deal. You will reverse it and it will work, but you are having obstruction somewhere else. So we don't advise when the, there is a longer duration since the procedure itself. But those couple, for example, say, look, we only want to have one child and I want to keep my vasectomy. So that's another option here that you will go toward doing IVF. IVF will achieve that, okay? Especially um, if, 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 the, uh, if the female partner is young, she will get pregnant hopefully quickly. The other category where, where there is the female partner, say, older than 40 years old. At the age of 40, uh, the female who is 40, already, unfortunately, the, the, the fertility has decreased substantially. And her chance of getting pregnant naturally, even if there is something, if there is nothing wrong with her or her husband, is only 5% every month. That's called fecundity rate. So doing a vasectomy here and looking for a 5% that's not probably uh, working very well here. So what, because if you do the IVF here, then the 40 years old will have three time, three to four times chance than achieving a natural conception. So between 15 and 20% success rate in this situation. And if the patient is with the same partner, so these couple really don't have fertility issues, but it's just the age here regarding the female. So usually, it, 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 then, then here we choose more to do IVF compared to the vasectomy reversal. And another common question people ask, saying, all right, can we, uh, from the sperm that we retrieve from the testis surgically, can we use it for insemination? No, because the number of sperm that we are going to get, the concentration is very, very small. Naturally, you need 14,000 sperm because uh, to, for, for, for one of them to reach to the egg, 
but 14,000 sperm is not going to do the job, right? But every 14,000 sperm, one of them will reach to the egg to fertilize it. So the sperm that we will retrieve surgically will not be enough at all uh, for insemination. So here, the female partner has to do IVF. So we can retrieve the eggs from her and then, um, and then inject the sperm into the eggs. Now, in every um, topic about male infertility, people are very obsessed by the lifestyle. The reality is that uh, there are many, the, the, the studies that are looking at lifestyle, there are lots of shortcomings there. They are not proper studies, right? Um, this is what we call observational study. You need to do a randomized controlled study. This is the high, higher hierarchy of, of studies so that you can find out if that particular lifestyle has effect on the fertility of the male or not. It's not only just the studies which have issues. Um, what happened is that it is very hard for you to concentrate on one variable, like say, I wanna check for smoking. And most of the time that guy who is heavily smoke, smoker is drinking alcohol a lot as well, or whatever. So <clears throat> there is multiple variables there that will be extremely hard to control. The other thing is that most of the studies that has been done to tell you about a certain component or chemical, they are mostly from animal studies. And it's very hard to translate what happened in animal studies to the human being. And what's more important here is that most of the studies that has been done with male infertility, they are looking at um, sperm which have a concentration, for example, say just below average. We say the average is 75, okay? So they are looking at someone who has 30 millions and if I give you antioxidants or give you this or that, I want it to go to, you know, another extra 10 millions. So what, okay? That's not the outcome that you are looking at. I'm not looking at just increasing the sperm count. I'm looking at pregnancy, not only pregnancy. I'm looking at having a baby, which we call live birth. So very hard to find any study that correlates the, that particular factor which is implicated with live birth rate. So you cannot say that there is one particular lifestyle factor here will have an effect. But what we do as um, fertility specialists or as health uh, uh, carers is that we will advise you to have a good healthy lifestyle. We will tell you not to smoke, we will tell you not to drink alcohol, we will tell you not to take drugs, we will tell you to stop uh, taking steroids, uh, we will tell you to exercise, we will tell you not to expose yourself to the heat, and we will tell you to try to maintain a normal body weight, okay? But every single factor of those does not have a major implication on the fertility because there are other things that can be done to overcome that problem. Last thing is uh, people, there is a lot of talk recently about the paternal age. Does the fertility of men decrease uh, with aging? Uh, is there any implication on the fertility or not? Again, there is some association and that's the same thing that happens with the lifestyle factors. There is no causation problems, okay? We cannot say, all right, because the thing is, if for example, I say smoking 10 cigarettes per day cause infertility for you, then if I ask you to stop smoking for three months, I, you should get pregnant after that. That's not usually the case, but it's very important for you to stop smoking. There is usually association between the factor which is implicated in fertility and other uh, problems like so with age they say okay when we are aging obviously there will be some drop in the hormone testosterone with time when we talk about aging we talk about between 35 and 40 and above uh, obviously the sexual desire will decrease erectile dysfunction will increase and also you can have some changes on the sperm parameters like lower sperm count lower motility and so forth and most importantly, uh, DNA damage to, to the sperm or DNA fragmentation. Um, and, and these are the explanations why 
the uh, aging male can be associated with certain problems. What are these certain problems? Like autism, for example. There is an Israeli study that showed that uh, if you are above 40 years old, there is uh, six times chance that the child may have autism. Uh, also schizophrenia, twice chance compared to the normal if the father is above 40 years old. There is a couple of other syndromes that are very, very rare, and it's very, very difficult for you to say, ah, oh, yeah, that's because of the advanced paternal age. Male physiology is different than female physiology. Male is always having a reproduction of the sperm formation. Women, on the contrary, they are born with a certain number of eggs, and as we get older, we are losing uh, the eggs. And as we said before, contribution to the embryo is not equal. Okay, and, the, and a healthy young egg can actually uh, uh, improve the quality of that sperm and result in fertilization and embryo formation. There is, uh, see, you can tell from here that it is a relative thing. So you see a couple who, for example, at the age of, say, 34, they have a child, no problems, having another one after that, and the lady now, say, 41 years old, and they think to have a third child. And you do the investigations, you will find that there was like, say, problem with the sperm, like the count, say, 13 millions, right? But this guy, we, we repeated the sperm test again, it's still 13 millions. So that guy has, doesn't ha didn't have any change on his sperm at all. So when he was like eight years ago, when his wife was 34 years old, they were able to have two children without any problems because she was having a young egg that was able to overcome that a bit lower than normal count. Now, because the eggs are aging or getting older, not able to fix that issue. And then we have that infertility issue comes up. So it just tells you that it is a relative thing, okay? Um, I hope, uh, I don't know what's the time now, but I hope that uh, by this we, we have gone through a lot of uh, information. It's actually a full course about male infertility and um, uh, I hope that um, I think there are some questions here. I'm sorry that I was taking by. So let's uh, let's go through these um, the questions here. So um, we have a question from Vanessa. Hi, good evening. No, uh, uh, good evening, Vanessa. That was not a question. Matthew, uh, say, hi, Dr. Zaini. How does lifestyle impact fertility and what role does stress play? All right, so that's a good question. Uh, I have explained in general the whole situation, but recently there was a study that came from Denmark. They actually have a very good register there for everything. Okay, so they were looking at about between 300 and 400 uh, patients and they were looking at stress uh, events in life and they found at the end that there is no um, it, it didn't it didn't affect the fertility itself for sure we can say okay stress may make the man just inability in able to perform or you know it may be associated with a bit of situational erectile dysfunction but the the parameters of the sperm itself hasn't been changed um, so, uh, next question from Mila. Uh, does a lot of exercise impact on male infertility or difficulty to get pregnant for female? It depends on what you mean by a lot of exercise. But again, the, the whole idea here is that we are trying to get the testicular environment in a, to, 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 to present in a lower temperature than the, than, than the whole body, okay? So working out for long hours, especially if you are wearing some uh, tight pants or in an area which is hot, probably can have an impact, but it's not going to be like a severe impact. Debra, hi, Dr. Hassam, love from Josh and Deb, hello. Um, and Nitim Kana, hello Nitim. And Jolie, hello Jolie. Jolie, can you please explain what our options are after a vasectomy? Is there any possibility for us to use surgically extracted sperm for IUI? Uh, I actually have answered that question. Uh, hi, Dr. Zini, amazing, thank you. Bianca and uh, Deborah. 
Um, we agree, you are amazing, Dr. Zaini. Okay, you make me feel blush now. Without you, uh, we wouldn't have our baby girl, Marissa. Thank you very much and enjoy. Um, Jolly, Klein, are there uh, genetic or uh, aging issues uh, that hurt male fertility? Does family history matter? Uh, obviously, uh, when we talk about family matters, so obviously, you know, like if we are talking about a male, his father was able to have him, okay? But the problem usually when we talk about genetic issues, if, for example, say, uh, obviously the father, if the father is having a cystic fibrosis uh, gene and it happens that he was lucky and uh, there was no blockage there and he passed that um, gene to the child, he may have blockage. Uh, uh, and have that what we call um, bilateral absence of the vase. That's one part where family history uh, uh, working. The other part is um, uh, probably is a genetic, but but not in the in the sense of we call it de novo mutation, like the YQ microdeletion. So the father will be okay, but then after the sperm fertilize the egg to form that male in the future, we have those new mutations that lead to infertility. <clears throat> uh, Nitin, uh, just a quick question, doctor, is a 5AA grade good for a blastocyst embryo? It's amazing. 5AA means that it is a hatching blastocyst which is ready to implant. Uh, as you can see, he is asking me 5AA. So there is a number there and there is two um, letters. So the five means the stage of development. So it has to do with uh, development in relation to the timing. So there are six stages there, right? We like the embryo to be between four and five, okay? AA, obviously better than B and better than C. Um, Andrea, hello, Hassam. How are you, Andrea? And Marianne asking, hi, Hassam. Love, Marianne, Fidi, and Brian. They are very dear patience to me. Very special. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, I think we will finish by now. And thank you very much for your attendance and enjoy your night. Thank you.